In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. 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 Three weeks ago, we started a new series we're calling Spirit and Truth. And throughout the summer as we're, we're going through this series, really what we're looking at is what is the culture that God has set for a local body of believers? Like, what is the culture of church actually supposed to look like? And we, we talked about week one, how in our minds, we've kind of created what we're calling these dumb dichotomies, where we'll look at scripture and, and we'll say things like, well, am I supposed to be a person who just is really nice to other people that I just walk in grace all the time? Or am I supposed to be a person that actually speaks truth, hard truths? Do it in love, but speak truth to people. And we kind of create these boxes, and we have to say, well, it's either going to be either this or that. And Jesus' answer is, well, it's both, right? We're supposed to be men and women that love the Word of God, that love theology, that love doctrine, that love the deep truths of the Word. And we're supposed to be men and women that seek after and crave and love the power, the presence, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, but we kind of divide ourselves in the camps, and Jesus says, no, it's one and the same. I mean, I love the fact that the word of God, we're told in 2 Timothy 3.16, is God breathed. Literally, that word breath is pneuma in Greek, which means spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who gave us the word, right? I'm of the word. No, you're of the spirit if you like the word, because the word is spirit, right? It all works together. So we're This summer, really looking at, okay, what is that culture of what a local body of believers is supposed to look at? And what we're going to look at today is learning. Let me say it like this. A body of believers should be ones who are continually growing in the amount of freedom that they walk in. Okay? That's what we're going to be looking at today. How do I I get free, stay free, walk in freedom? Because when, when somebody comes in, to church, when somebody sees members of Living Stones out in the community, they should see people who are not perfect and who are not perfectly free, but that are on a journey, a process, making progress and getting more free. I said it a couple weeks ago, but you know, when somebody goes to the gym, I just started a new gym membership at Pacific Island. Thank you for commenting on it. <laughs> you know, like if I go to the gym, I expect to get results. Like going to the gym is supposed to do something to me right? When we come together as a local body of believers, as a church, and when we're following Jesus together, that's supposed to do something to us. What's it supposed to do? In part, it's supposed to make us more free. We're supposed to experience greater depths of freedom. Now, here's the thing. When we're talking about overcoming sin and becoming more free, some of it You know, some of us handle it a little bit like we handle um, maybe past relationships that we've had. You know, how many of you have seen uh, a couple that were dating break up? There's typically two options that they have. They can either have a clean breakup or they can have a messy breakup, right? Clean breakup, they come together. You know what? This just isn't working out. This isn't right. This isn't what the Lord has for us. There's a clean break. They don't come back together. They don't keep dating. It's just one done. It's done. But then there's the messy. How many of you guys have seen a messy breakup? You know, it's like, well, okay, we're separated. But I really miss him, and, and I really miss him, and, and, and we fight all the time, and we hate each other, but we're coming back together, right? And then it's like, no, no, this isn't right, this isn't right. Okay, we're breaking up, and we're coming back together, and we're breaking up. And you're looking from the outside, and you're like, well, one of you just move, please, just leave, right? <laughs> you're making my life miserable just having to watch you. Some of us, our experience with freedom, and maybe more accurately, our experience with the power of sin in our life, a lack of freedom, has been like a messy breakup. I mean, how many of you, when you came to Christ, were a little bit surprised that you came and you're like, yes, I'm forgiven, I have heaven, I have a relationship with God, but I am completely still addicted to this, and I'm completely under bondage to this, and just like, why is anger still ruling my life? Why is my mouth so full of God? You know, like, we look at our lives and we go, oh, I mean, were you guys surprised by that at all? It's because when we give our lives to Jesus, in a moment, we're forgiven, You could say it like this, the penalty of our sin is done away with forever. 
But there's still the power of sin that's lurking in our lives. Now, Jesus has overcome the power of sin through the cross, but part of our job in learning how to gain more freedom from sin is allowing Jesus to come into the different rooms of our lives to expose the sin and then go into the cross and saying, Jesus, what you accomplished on the cross, I'm now applying to this area where sin has overcome me. Right? Christ has overcome all sin. You haven't overcome all sin in your life yet. All right? And so what we're going to look at today is basically this. How do we make a clean break with sin? We're going to look at a couple things. I've probably got two hours worth of material. I could probably make it into 20 hours worth of material. But it's Father's Day, and I'm not going to keep us here forever. Hold me to it, okay? Sometimes I get rolling. I preach what's called the eternal gospel. How do we make a clean break with sin? I'm just going to jump right into it. A couple things we're going to look at. Number one, if you want to make a clean break with sin and you want to experience more freedom, you need to recognize your condition. You need to recognize your condition. What do I mean? You got to go back to Genesis and look at the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3, God creates Adam and Eve. He creates the world. They're sinless. They're perfect. They're complete. They fall. They sin. What happened when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit? Two things. Number one, sin became something that Adam now naturally did. Okay, this is important to understand. Before they ate the fruit, sin was unnatural for them. It just, it, there wasn't like this propensity towards it. It wasn't, you know, just part of the norm for them. It was an unnatural thing. But once they ate that fruit, they received what's called a sin nature. And now, sin just became the norm. It became way easier to sin than it had ever done, you know, ever was before. Here's the second thing. Good old Adam, because of the choice he made, now caused us to inherit a sinful nature just like he got. Okay? Adam's sin caused us to inherit a sinful nature that's naturally opposed to God and his moral law. You know, I I told you I have five kids. Never once did I have to teach them how to sin. Like, they came out, and they were just like, I remember one of them came out, and they just had this look on their face like, what did you just put me through, right? Like, I never had to teach them how to get angry. I never had to teach them how to say no. You know, like, Sarah and I, I think it was with Zoe, I forget which kid. Sarah and I were like, mama, dada. Mama, dad, you know what their first word was? No. (laughs) Where did that come from? It's Adam's fault. (laughs) It's the sin nature that's inside of each and every one of us. That's why Paul will say in Romans 7, he says, I know that nothing good dwells in me. Jeremiah will say this in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? David will say this in Psalm 51. I was brought forth, like born in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So not only as I'm brought forth, but even from the moment of conception, David says, we got a sin nature. He'll again say this in Psalm 58, the wicked go astray from birth. Amen to that if you got kids. <laughs> like we, we just have this natural propensity now to sin. And each and every one of us are born under the power of sin, under the penalty of sin because of the choices that we make. Now, some goes, well, well, if it's Adam's fault, how can it be my fault too? Because you still made the choice to sin. We've got a natural propensity. I've got a natural propensity to eat ice cream and brownies every night, but it's still my choice, right? So we have a natural propensity to sin because we have a sin nature, but we're still held accountable because we choose to act on it. Now, some of you are a little confused because you're going, well, well, hey, I'm basically a good person. I was having a conversation with one of our small group leaders, and they said, hey, yeah, you know, we're having this conversation, and, and you know, somebody was speaking up saying, well, I'm basically a good person. And they're like, yeah, because you're in Christ, right? No, 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 even apart from Christ, I'm basically a good person. And I was like, well, there's a deep lack of understanding right there. Some of us, you know, some of you still think that you're basically a good person. I used to think that until I got married. (laughs) Now there's a litmus test daily showing me that I'm not. (laughs) 
For those of us that say, well, I'm basically a good person, let me ask you this, by whose standard? By whose standard are you basically a good person? By whose standard did I used to believe I was basically a good person? Well, I can tell you what it was for me, and I'm guessing it probably was the same for you. I would just compare myself to other people. Yeah, I've got some issues, I've made some mistakes, but have you seen that idiot over there? Right? Some of you, that's how your marriage works. And you wonder why it's so difficult. But here's the thing, Jesus never allowed us to base our standing before God on how good or bad other people were. And let me read you a couple of verses. In Romans 3, verse 9, Paul's speaking, and he says, Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Now, you got to understand, for us, we're like, Jews, Gentiles, it doesn't make sense. Okay, Jews were all the good people. Follow the law, follow the rules. You look at their life, and like, man, upstanding citizens. They're the good people. Gentiles were all the pagans, the bad ones. Paul says, you can't play the comparison game. Jews and Gentiles alike, the ones that look good, the ones that look bad on the outside, they're all under the power of sin. Jesus, in Matthew 5, is speaking on his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He says this, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, we go Pharisees, teachers of the law. This was like the elite Jews. Think of like the Navy SEALs of good people. This was them. Right? I mean, these were the guys that literally day and night, all they thought about was keep the law, keep the law, keep the law, be good, be good, be good. And Jesus says, okay, you want to play a comparison game? Think of the best person. Think of Mother Teresa. Think of Billy Graham. Think of the people that we would say, man, if I could just be like them. He says, if you want to play that game and you think you're getting in and that you're a good person, you got to be better than them. And there's like, the responses, the response back then was, there's no way. And Jesus says, exactly. Because you have to recognize your condition. If you're going to be set free from sin, you can't think that you're a good person. And you can't think that you can become a good person in your own strength. Like, you just can't. That's not how it works. Jesus will go on and say, in John chapter 8, he says, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. Have you ever felt enslaved to your sin before? You ever felt like there's an outside force that's actually inside of you that's controlling your actions? You're like, I don't want to do these things anymore, but you keep doing them. Why? Because Jesus says that when we sin, we're actually allowing sin to come in and be the boss, be the master, be in charge, be in control. He says, if you sin, you're now a slave to that sin. That's the condition that we find ourselves in. And when we're slaves to sin, it means we have no freedom. And when we're slaves to sins, it means that sin has power over us. And when we're a slave to sin, another uh, uh, word that Jesus used for it is that we have strongholds in our lives. All right, what's a stronghold? It's a sin that has a strong hold on your life what it is, right? For you, I mean, it could be anything, right? We all have our different flavors of sin. We all have our favorites, right? And we all have those areas that have a tighter grip, that stranglehold on our life. Jesus says, you got to, the first step to getting free is just recognizing your condition, that you're a slave to sin apart from Christ, that you don't have power to beat it. What Jesus did, he said, was that he actually came to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, to not stay dead, but to rise again so that he could conquer sin and death for all eternity with the purpose of setting people free. And it's so interesting because Jesus, when he walked the earth and and, and was ministering and teaching people, he actually taught people two kind of opposing ideas. The first one is he would look at people and he'd say, you're worse than you thought you were. You thought you were kind of bad. Actually, you're really bad. You thought you were good. Nope, you're not good. And Jesus taught that nobody's good enough to earn God's favor. 
But then in the same breath, he would say, oh, by the way, God loves you just the way you are. It's like these two opposing ideas, and it brought confusion to people because they're going, well, which is it? Either I'm terrible or God loves me. And Jesus said, actually, it's both. You're terrible and God loves you. (laughs) Andy Stanley, I think, puts it really well. He says this, you're worse than you thought, and God loves you more than you imagine. So Jesus taught. So in order to get set free from the power of sin, you just need to agree with Jesus. I'm a terrible person. There's nothing good in me. That's what scripture says. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No, not one is righteous. None do good, is what Paul will say in Romans 3. And when Christ comes in and brings salvation, you got to understand, like, he didn't go through the pain and the sacrifice of the cross just to help good people become better people. He came to save terrible people. Jesus was in a conversation once with all the uh, good people, the religious leaders, the Pharisees. And they came because they were angry that Jesus was hanging out with terrible people. Terrible people that knew that they were terrible people. And so they come and they're like, don't you know who you're around? And in Luke 5, Jesus answered them and said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Do you know that you're a sinner? Do you know that sin has power over your life? If you do, you're in a great place because that's the first step to actually getting set free from that sin. Here's the second step. Jesus said it. He said, I came to those who know that they are sinners, and then he gave us a second step, and know that they need to repent. That's the second thing. You gotta understand your condition, recognize your condition, and number two, you need to repent of your sin. How many of you like that word repent? I don't. I don't like the word repent for two reasons. The first one, and both of these reasons really are a definition of what repentance is. If we're going to understand what repentance is, you got to understand it involves two things. You know, typically when we think of, okay, repent from your sins, we just think of saying, I'm sorry, right? That's really not what repentance means. The word repent literally means to turn away from. But in order to fully repent, you've got to understand that repentance involves two things. The first thing that it means is that I actually take full responsibility for my sin. Like, you can't just be like, oh, you know, I'm sorry, it wasn't a big deal, and think that you're repenting. You've got to take full responsibility. Like, God has created you as a human being who can make powerful choices. And when I make a choice to sin, I've got to say, that was me, I did it, guilty. But typically what I do, and you've probably done this too, is we play the blame game, right? Again, this is Adam's fault. He started it. (laughs) You go back to the story of when Adam and Eve fell. God comes. Adam, what'd you do? I mean, he didn't say it quite with that tone, but, you know, basically. Look what Adam says, Genesis 3, verse 12. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. He's blaming two people. Number one, he's blaming God, not recommended. And then he's blaming his wife, kind of recommended. (laughs) Not really. It's Father's Day, remember? It's all about me. So Adam plays the blame game, right? This isn't my fault, God. You're the one that came up with the idea for in the first place. I'm just a victim of my circumstances. It's just, it's the man, right? It's the powers above me. They're the ones that are causing me to act this way. It wasn't my choice. You did this. She did this. Well, Eve doesn't do any better. Very next verse, it says, Then the Lord God asked the woman, Okay, Eve, what happened? What have you done? She says, The serpent deceived me. The devil made me do it. Right? That's why I ate it. She does the exact same thing. Why? Because her husband 
Oh, this is a, okay, Father's. You ready? Here's my Father's Day message. (laughs) When you sin, whether it's passivity, whether it's pornography, whether it's anger, whatever it is, you as the strong man of your house now just open the door for your entire family to be tempted in a new and more powerful way with that exact same sin. So don't sin. It's not just about you. Okay? Adam played the blame game. Now the enemy came in. Eve, you can do the exact same thing. He opened the doorway for Eve now to be tempted in greater measure with the same sin that he just committed. Okay? So we see the blame game, but here's the problem. God says if we're going to be forgiven of something, we've got to take full responsibility for whatever that something is. You know, when we try to play the the blame game, we'll say things like, well, I was in an impossible situation. I had no choice. Or we'll say, they did me wrong first. Or I ran with the wrong crowd. Or it was a difficult time. Think of all the stress I was under. Or my wife was impossible to live with. Or my husband was impossible to live with. Whatever it was, right? A couple weeks ago, I had um, my daughter Reese come up, and she had punched her brother. This happens a lot in my family. And so I'm disciplining her. I'm correcting her. Reese, you do not get to punch your brother. She's like the little titta of the house. She's the youngest, but it's like, you don't mess with Reese. And her response was, yeah, but he, and I stopped her right there. No, 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 I don't want to hear what he did. I'll deal with that later. Right now, we're talking about what you did. Yeah, but dad, da, da, da. no, 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 no. You made a choice. And there's always going to be people that hurt you always going to be people that make you angry, always going to be people that do things that you don't like, but you can never give them the power of causing you to sin. You're responsible. You made a choice, Reese, right? I'm trying to teach you. I love how Todd White says, he says, don't let sin against you become sin in you. Now, what's funny is that same day, Sarah and I got in an argument and I was being a jerk about something and I forget what. And so she calls me on it and guess what I do? This is your fault. (laughs) I do the exact same thing that I was just disciplining Reese for. It's a struggle. It's a process that we're all going through, right? But we can't play the blame game. We've got to take full responsibility for our sin. That's what it means to repent. And what some of us do is, in an attempt to not take full responsibility for our sin, we won't call it sin. We'll just call it a mistake, right? Right? oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't really mean to. I just, I just made a mistake, right? Sin, let me give you a definition of sin real quick that I think will help us. Sin is a willful or deliberate violation of divine law. Emphasis on willful and deliberate, okay? Sin means I did it on purpose. But we don't want to admit that. We don't want to take responsibility for that. So we'll say, well, it was just a mistake, you know? I didn't know better. And the assumption is, You know, you can't be too mad at me because it was just a mistake, okay? Or I really don't need to ask for forgiveness because it was just a mistake. Can we just move on, okay? The idea with when we're, we're, you know, calling it a mistake is, look, it was just a mess up. It was just a mistake. I can do better. I just need to try harder, put some more effort into it, and then I'll become a better person. But Jesus doesn't give us the privilege of making mistakes. He says, no, you sinned. And this is really important. And and you got to hear me on this. There is no forgiveness. Let me say it like this. There's no freedom unless there's forgiveness. There's no forgiveness of mistakes. There's only forgiveness of sin. There's no freedom unless there's forgiveness. There's no forgiveness unless there's repentance. And you cannot repent of a mistake. You can only repent of sin. Okay? So when I repent, I got to take full ownership of what's mine. I got to call it what it is. No, that wasn't a mistake. No, it's not somebody else's fault. I, as a powerful human being, made a decision, a willful, deliberate decision to sin. Yes, I might have, you know, exceptional circumstances. Yes, it's a stronghold in my life. 
Yes, my mom and my dad have the same thing. All those things are real. Yes, I might have a stronger propensity to this sin, but if you're ever going to be set free, you've got to call it what it is, okay? Let's look at a verse together. 1 John 1.9 1, says, but if we confess our mistakes, no, it says, but if we confess our sins. Is that up there? No. Nope. But if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Important verse. If we confess, take full ownership, repent of sin, God promises to do two things. Forgive us, right? But then also to cleanse us. That means he's going to say you're justified, you're forgiven. The penalty's been paid by Jesus. But cleansing us from all unrighteousness also means that he's now going to start the process of coming in through the power of the Holy Spirit to break the power of that sin in your life. If there's no repentance, ownership of it, there's no power to come in to free you from it. Okay? So that's the first thing that repentance means. Here's the second thing that repentance means. And I think this is equally as important. First one, I got to take full ownership of it. Secondly, repentance means that I hate my sin. I hate my sin. There's kind of this false repentance that's going around. I've done it too. Where instead of really hating the sin, we hate the consequences of our sin. Or instead of hating the sin, we hate the fact that we got caught. Paul will say it in words like this. He'll say there's a worldly sorrow and then there's a sorrow that actually leads to repentance. There's a worldly sorrow that's sad. Oh, I hate the fact that I did wrong. Da, 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 da. But really what you're saying is I hate the consequences. I hate the fact that I'm still in this argument with my wife and she hasn't let it go yet. I wish I wouldn't have done it just to shut her up. Men. Women, you've done the same thing. I just hate the consequence. If I could do it again, yeah, maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. I probably would if I wouldn't get caught because I still really like the sin. I just hate the consequences. That's not repentance. Repentance is coming to a place where we actually hate the old way of life, where we actually hate the sin in our lives. Brian and Christy Brent uh, wrote a great book called, um, what's that book called, maybe? You can't remember either. Uh, Salvation Encounter, I think is what it's called. And, and they gave a really great definition. They said this, when the love of God fills you, it causes you to suddenly realize that all you want to do is run from your old life and chase Jesus. Okay, let me read that again. When the love of God fills you, it causes you to suddenly realize that all you want in life, that all you want to do is to run from your old life, to hate your sin, and to chase Jesus. That's what true repentance is. Repentance is what happens when we see Jesus. When we see Jesus, we begin to hate our sin. When we see Jesus, we have true grief, true sorrow that leads us to repentance because we hate what it does to our relationship with Jesus, because we hate that we've offended God Almighty. Because Jesus hates sin, we now hate sin. Repentance is what happens when we see Jesus. It's not just a hatred of the consequences. And so if we're really going to get set free, we got to repent. And if we're really going to repent, we got to take ownership, and we have to begin to hate the sin. Now, this is easier said than done. I've got sins in my life that I'm not walking in, but there's still a part of me that's kind of like, I kind of like them still. I kind of like getting angry and yelling when I don't get my way. My kids really like that. <laughs> right? But I think there's a process that we can go through Whereas we fix our eyes on Jesus, we can actually ask him, God, I want to hate what you hate. For some of you, the true power and the true freedom that's going to come is when you take that step first and recognize where you're at. Jesus, I like this sin a lot. But I like you more. 
And then you take that step and say, Jesus, you, you got to do a work in me. Holy Spirit, you got to come in and fix the insides. Make me hate what you hate. Make me detest the sin in my life. And it brings us into that process of true repentance. That's the two things that repentance includes. But here's two more things for you. There's two things that actually happen when we repent. Okay, this is very important. So when we come to a place and we look at our sin, full ownership, my choice, my responsibility, I did it, and we begin to hate our sin or at least cry out to Jesus to help us to hate our sin, two things happen. The first thing is this. We are totally, everyone say totally. totally. Okay, like completely, like not even a little bit left over, forgiven. We're just forgiven. That means Jesus says there's no more punishment for that sin. There's no more penalty for that sin. There's no divine justice that's going to come against you, divine wrath, because all of that was poured out on Jesus on the cross. God was so good at punishing Jesus that he ran out of punishment for you. That's what the cross means. And so in an instant, in a moment, when we truly repent, we're completely forgiven. Now we'll talk about this in coming weeks. God doesn't punish us or pour out wrath, but because he loves us as our father, just like I love my kids, he will discipline us, which is very different. Punishment, wrath, done in anger, discipline is not. It's done out of a heart of compassion that wants to see the best for its kids, right? So in a moment, we're totally forgiven, but we're also washed clean. That the Holy Spirit comes in and says, this isn't who you are anymore. I'm actually dressing you with the, what Scripture calls the robes of righteousness, Christ's righteousness. That you actually now have the power of the Holy Spirit to live out who God has created you to be. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he said, Behold, the, the new has come, the oldest passed away, that in Christ we are a new creation. It's a declaration that he's made because of repentance when we come to Jesus and receive him. And then the fun part of being a Christian is learning how to act like who God has declared us to be. You're a new creation. Now you actually have the freedom and the power because of the Holy Spirit to act like a new creation. And so when we repent, we're completely forgiven and completely washed clean. About five years ago, I had a PC laptop. Last time I ever had a PC, I'm a Mac guy through and through now. But I had a laptop that had all of our, our pictures on it from like when Sarah and I were engaged to first kid, everything like that. And I guess this was even a little bit longer than that. Didn't have anything backed up to the cloud. It was all on that hard drive and the computer, poof, crashed and we lost everything every file deleted so upset right when god forgives us it's like the, those files on that particular sin they just crash they're deleted forever that entire file is gone it's not not like there's a ghost copy it's not like there's a copy in the cloud it's done with that's what god promises when we repent and receive forgiveness from him. Which means God's not going to hold your past sin over your head. Right? I know you have people in your life that do that, but God's not one of them. So what's our response to the forgiveness that God gives us? It's really simple. You receive it. So when we repent, take full ownership, it's mine, begin to hate our sin, Jesus says, you are declared forgiven. Our response is to receive the forgiveness. If you have repented and asked for forgiveness and you still feel guilty, you still feel shame or regret over what you've already been forgiven for, and if you find yourself constantly going back to that past sin and bringing it back up with God and asking for forgiveness again, something's wrong with you, not God. God's forgiveness didn't fall short. You fell short in receiving it. Really what you said is that your sin and your ability to sin was greater than God's ability for, to forgive. It's just dumb. But what you do is you go back and say, no, this is what scripture says. This is the word 
and the Spirit working together. Jesus, you have declared that because of what you did on the cross and because I received it and repented of my sin, that I am forgiven, I am washed clean. And then you invite the Holy Spirit to come in and clean up your feelings. And he comes in and as you grab hold of that truth, he says, you are forgiven and you begin this process of actually feeling forgiven. Do you guys know that God wants you to feel forgiven? Some of you had parents growing up that never wanted you to quite feel forgiven. They were holding that over you to manipulate you and to control you into obedience or to control you into doing what they want. God doesn't operate that way. He says that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, not control. His goal is to actually release you in complete freedom so that you can be like Christ and walk in self-control. Right? Here's the second thing that happens when we truly repent. Number two, the hold that Satan has on your life in that particular area is defeated. Right? Remember that stronghold that sin had, you were a slave to sin, that's the enemy, that's, that's Satan having control in your life. When we repent of that specific area, that particular room in our life that we've given Jesus access to and said, your power on the cross, that's for here, this for now, that's for this spot, the enemy's hold is broken. The power of the enemy is actually defeated. Now here's the thing. Typically, when we repent of our sins, the power of every sin in our life doesn't all get broken at one time. I wish it did. And if it's worked that way for you, tell me your secret. But for me, it's typically been room by room, area by area, bondage by bondage, where the Lord's revealed it, or the Lord's used my wife to reveal it. (laughs) And then I have to take it to Jesus. I have to own it, hate it, repent of it, receive forgiveness, receive cleansing, And then in that area, now the power that the enemy had over me begins to crumble. And now I actually get to begin to walk in freedom. So what's our response to the fact that when we repent, God breaks the power that Satan has over that area? Now this isn't our power, this is Jesus. Jesus comes in and says, enemy, that power, that stronghold, that's broken. Now what we do is like that little kid that's playing cops, you know, and dresses up with the badge and the plastic toy gun and everything that really has no power, but his dad, who's a real cop, is standing right behind him. We say, in Jesus' name, enemy, you get out of my life. You don't have power over me in this area anymore. We take the authority and the power that Jesus has, and he's lent to us, and we say, this is going to stop. This is going to stop. We recognize that we're forgiven, we receive it. We recognize that the hold, that stronghold that Satan had in our life is broken because of what Jesus did, because we've repented and received forgiveness. And then we step into that place of power and we begin to rebuke the enemy. No, Satan, you don't get to destroy my family. No, you don't get to boss me around anymore. Jesus is in charge of my life. Does that make sense? I mean, I want to encourage you I want to encourage you, when we're talking about walking in freedom, more than anything, this is a war cry. Because the enemy does not stop trying to steal, kill, and destroy. It's not a once and done thing. You will gain more traction, more momentum, have more victory. But the enemy tries to get you down. And so it's a war cry of freedom saying, that's not what Jesus paid the price for. No, I'm not going back into bondage. No, I'm not going to allow you to destroy in the way you want to. And so each day, we get back up. If we fall, we get back up. And we do it again. Jesus, I recognize what's mine. This is sin. I repent of it. I receive your forgiveness. I'm rebuking the enemy. Got it? That's the short version. I'm convinced we need to do like a whole series on freedom because there's just so much we can go into. But this is the groundwork. This is the foundation This is that combination of spirit and truth that we need to actually begin walking in freedom. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Jesus, that you came not just to make us better people, but you came to set us free. 
I just declare the truth. You say where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit, into every room of our life to come and clean house. Declare, Lord, that you, what you say, that we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. We welcome truth into our lives, Jesus. And we make that war cry. Enemy, you are not going to have power over us any longer. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus and declare that in Christ, we're fully loved, we're fully accepted, and we're fully forgiven. We thank you for that, Lord, and we praise you for that. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.